Oh, okay. I'm recording. All right, y'all. Hey, welcome to Hate Street Voice. Rita Gentry is here. I'm so excited. Rita. Hi, Rita. Hi. Uh, Rita worked with Bill Graham from 79 to 99 and Carlos Santana and various and sundry. She's just come out with a book uh, called Before I Forget, Before I Forget. Um, <laughs> and it's a fantastic read. We'll get to that later. But um, the theme I wanted to tell you, Rita, for this edition, number 15 of the Hate Street Voice, is pioneering spirits. And I didn't even know that I was going to meet you or have this interview, but I mean, what more of a pioneering spirit than Mr. Bill Graham and and, and yourself as well, coming from the Bay, from San Francisco itself and, and, and the trajectory trajectory that you've had in your life, you know, and, and um, I think that that's... Um, it's funny that when I sort of solidified that's going to be the theme of this edition now, all of a sudden that energy is the pioneering spirits are sort of coming out of the woodwork. And reading the book, which is unbelievably, um, I was telling you that my first concert was in 78 at Winterland. I saw the Sex Pistols and um, it changed my life forever. But the book starts basically in 79. I mean, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, the it goes back to when you grew up here, but as far as working with Bill. So this full circle theme I sort of wanted to tap into during this interview of having lived in the Haight-Ashbury. Um, I was there in 81 and, you know, moved to New York because I was so tired of the hippie crap and became a journalist out, out there in New York and coming back full circle and now be back in the Haight-Ashbury. And here I am revisiting Bill Graham, the music scene in SF and how the, the beauty of that and being immersed in this book for the last week um, the magic of, of the music scene and the scene itself in San Francisco. Welcome, Rita. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I really appreciate uh, you giving me a voice to let people know about Mr. Bill Graham, who was my guru, my everything. Yeah. I mean, we should start for, I love the story of you hanging out with your dad growing up on 10th Avenue and Clement Street <laughs> and hanging out at O'Shea's bar with your papa. So, which is in the book, which is beautiful. If you want to just tap into that a little bit. And well, um, I was very blessed to be born into that. I got the two parents that I did. Um, my mom was a professional dancer and ended up when I was young, opening up a studio on 10th Avenue in the bottom of my grandmother's house. And um, Vivian, and, I remember. Yeah, Vivian. And um, she was a good Portuguese woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father uh, always worked in garages and he was a blue collar worker. And my mother was in the arts. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's like my dad, when my mom would be teaching all the time. And in those days, you could take a kid into a bar. And I just can't believe, I mean, now my dad would be arrested, you know. <laughs> Um, but I, I learned a lot from uh, the characters that were there. You know, um, one of my uh, crazy stories is that I, I must have been like under five, but there was a guy that always sat at the end of the bar. And in those days, they had cigarette machines. You know, you go and put the coins in and cigarettes were dropped out. Mm -hmm. And he was teaching me how to read by memorizing cigarette packs. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God. I mean, it's like a no-no, but um, that's kind of funny because parallel. I grew up with my grandma uh, in Arinda, and she, my grandpa passed away, and she. So I grew up with my grandmother in the house as well, and she had Tarantin one hundreds, and Tarantin yeah. <laughs> Tarantin is a hard word to spell, really, if you think about it. I don't even know. Anyway, go ahead. And uh, so um, the thing was is that they also had a great jukebox there, and so and people always give me, you know, it's like a nickel or a dime back in those days. And I could play great music, but my forte with music was my mom being the dancing teacher and having a studio in our house is that she turned me on to every kind of music and dance imaginable. And that was my love. It was just a natural thing. You know, I just thought everybody danced, but they didn't. And um, so that was my awakening to music mm. and awakening to many different types of people, you know, gay, straight, everything, colors, you name it. And so I thank my mother for that. And I thank my parents for 
uh, being raised in San Francisco back in those days. Mm -hmm. um, downtown was a big different thing than what it is now. Downtown, you got dressed up. You do, That's where you went shopping. And, and I always tell the story of another form of music I got was they had a um, record stop, shop on Market Street. And there they had these booths. They were all glass, supposedly soundproof. But you could go in there, pull any record out. And my mom was always searching for music. So we would spend hours in this place, you know, yeah. in these glass booths. Unfortunately, they don't have those kinds of things. Now they have, you know, headphones. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it was very thriving. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of downtown, you know, having grown up in the in the Bay Area as well. Um, I Magnus, do you remember I Magnus? Oh my <laughs> God, I love I Magnus, Joseph Magnus. Brightex, Brightex fabric, yes, Brightex. still there. Yeah. yeah. And it was, um, it was just so great. And I think being a child there, you know, you had your Muni bus. So you'd have your school bus. Pet. You could just jump on a bus and go anywhere. Mm -hmm. you know, it was totally fine. And I could be by myself. And then in the neighborhood, there was the um, Coliseum Theater on Clement, like around 4th or 5th Avenue. Mm. And so you could go in there for a quarter you know, and watch all these great movies and musicals. Because then musicals were a big thing, you know, back in that day. Yeah. So music, the bottom line is music is my thing. And um, what was your actual real first concert, you know, where you were? Oh, geez. Um, I don't think that's in the book. I, I, I If it was. No, because I'm so ancient that <laughs> um, I think... It might have been canned heat or something like yeah. that, but it was at like an outdoor thing with Hell's Angels and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And and I think I was about, uh, I don't know, 17, 18 years old. Wow. So my that father, would have been in the mid early 60s? Mid yeah, my, my father would have had a heart attack. <laughs> um, but um, then from there, um, you know, because in my day and age, I mean, you couldn't even have a credit card unless you were married to somebody. You wow. know, you had to be a Mrs. So-and-so. So um, I ended up in back in San, as soon as I could graduate from Fremont, California, where my parents mm -hmm. moved to when I was in high school and I wanted to kill myself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I left and came back to the city. Sorry, people from Fremont. It's okay. Yeah, San Francisco is okay. One of my brothers still lives there, but whatever. <laughs> um, I I lived in so many places in the city, you know, from uh, the avenues to Noe Valley to the Mission. I mean, oh, God. Were, During, you, hang, were you hanging out in the Haight-Ashbury, say, in the 60s? I mean, in the heyday? I, mean, I, I would go there, but I didn't hang there, per se. Um, but during that time of the heyday of the Haight Ashbury, I I'm pretty sure I had like a I had a weird flat on Church Street, and I rented out rooms to people, you know. So the my rent was like you know twenty five dollars a month, yeah. and if the people that owned it, they would have had a heart attack. Uh, <laughs> but I came across like you know two young guys. They they were in the hate, and they ended up back at my place. They were like. 15, 16 years old, they ran away from home. And so I sort of took them under my wing for a little time. And then I ended up paying, I don't know why, for their tickets to go back home because I couldn't stand it anymore. Like, get out. <laughs> and their parents were very happy. Yeah. So it, it was a very, you know, that time period too was just so fantastic vibrant uh, and, and I, blossoming I, and it was it was a raw power that had never happened before which and is, i'm waiting for it to happen again well i would like to say that that i have it in my notes here that i i personally um feel like there's this full circle happening uh ben fong torres is a dear t friend of mine and and um the picture the image of bill behind me has the hieroglyphs that bill that herb green um, took the photo and he's got an exhibit now down at the hate street art center that I went to last week, as you well know, and, uh, you know, to be standing in front of those hieroglyphs and get photographs in front of those hieroglyphs and having had this picture of bill, it's always hard to point this picture of bill 
I mean, I've had this, this, it's a postcard taped to my wall, my various walls. I had this in New York, but, and then to be in front of it and then having lived down the corner of Hayton Ashbury and then moved to New York because I was sick of the hippie crap and being a block away from where I lived, you know, 1982 and full circle. Um, the full circle and and the energy and Dr. David E. Smith, who I've learned is a, is a friend of yours, the whole rock. I love him. Oh, he's a, he. We're working on the Hate Ashbury Psychedelic Center, which I really get to with you. But um, the old guard is is um, is so excited about the like psychedelics are being decriminalized now. Let's do it right. This That's time. unbelievable. I man. know. I know. <laughs> Just like a few months back, San Francisco decrimmed. Yeah. Um, and so, and then there's the psychedelic art and then Stanley Mouse just had an exhibit here that I worked out with Peter McQuaid, you know, here 1506. Thank you. S of heritage. So there was this, this realization shout out to COVID. I like to say, even though that sounds weird, I think there's this realization of, of, we can't let the magic be forgotten. We can't let the, 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 the kindness of people and the, and the magic of music go away or be forgotten. Um, and then just learning when I, after I found out I was going to meet you, thank you. Oh, shout out to Stefan. Uh, I never can never say his name. Gozakowski for, yeah. for turning me on to you and, and all of that. But um, there's this, this Renaissance happening and, and, and it's um, it's electric. And, and I, I, I just want to, I want to make it clear that, that the whole rock med thing, the whole psychedelic thing that, it's an honor that we're here and that we can keep, we can, we can be a torch for, for keeping this stuff alive. And then as Santana announced his tour, his summer tour, <laughs> the day to the, to the day, I know you got hired the, February 26, 1979, and you retired February 26, 1999. And here it is, you know, three days after that date. So I think it's just this beautiful synergy that's going on. Yeah. You know, I have <laughs> been so fortunate and I think a lot has to do with karma of being at um, the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Being a woman in this industry was not the easiest thing in the world. And that's why I give thanks to growing up in San Francisco is I got streetwise. Mm -hmm. And you have to be streetwise in order to, uh, because really rock and roll was like the Wild West. Oh, yeah. I mean, anything was, it was crazy, you know, kind of Babylonish, you know, it was, it was crazy. And um, those were the I, days of barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. I mean, the oh my God. compared to now, you know, yeah, I mean, so, like, I'll just throw it out there that from I'm, you know, six going to be 61. But as a music journalist, a woman backstage, there are the stereotypes that happen to me as well. And I can't even imagine how much more uh, accelerated that was back, you know, 20 or 15 years before, <laughs> you know. And yeah. they're kind of, I mean, because I started with bands, yeah, like early 70s. And mm -hmm. There wasn't, there was maybe a room was a backstage. There was nothing, you know, <laughs> and Bill um, changed it all. He just, he just, uh, he, he was just a master. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think what you're talking about COVID, COVID really made me sit down and put this book together. I mean, I've been working on it for four or five years going like, oh my God. And then I said one day, you know what? I'm just going to sit here, start transcribing, calling people. And, and, and then two years later, you know, there you go. And yeah. I'm, yeah. It's a story collecting. I mean, it's a, it's like a native tradition is this is the telling of stories and sitting around the fire and sharing each other's stories. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a beautiful book. Go ahead. I'm sorry. But you know, it's okay. I mean, and, and there was one story that I really wanted and there, there was an incident that happened with Led Zeppelin at a day on the green. Mm. And um, this gentleman by the name of Jim Sorkis, he was the one that took the wrath of the beatings of what happened. And I asked him for a story many years ago. And he said, no, I just can't write this story. And I said, oh, come on, Jim. But he sent me a beautiful story. I said, okay, I accept it. And I let it go. Then a couple of years ago, he called me up and said, you know what? I think I'm going to do the story if you help me transcribe and put it all together. I said, no problem. Mm -hmm. I write the story. We correct it. We make it into a beautiful story, which is a heavy duty story. And three months later, he dies of COVID. Oh. And I was like, oh, my God. Wow. 
But at the same time, it's almost like these messengers would come to me at different times. It's almost like to me, Bill was guiding this whole project and never in my wildest dreams would I think Rita Gentry would be putting out a freaking book, you know, to the world. <laughs> and when I stuck the book in an envelope and I mailed it off to the Library of Congress, I said, oh my God, Bill, you are in the Library of Congress now with my book. And it was just, <laughs> whoa, I'm going to party down. <laughs> I'm going to pull up the cover of the book. Uh, I, okay. I, it's it's a little cut off, but there it is. That's okay. It's, yeah, because this Zoom. And, and, yeah. and you know, I uh, thanks to Pat Johnson, mm. something's happening here on my computer. Um, uh, he was gracious enough to give me that photo. And the reason why I chose that photo is because all the other photos, he's flipping the bird or he's got the hat <laughs> on, you know, or it's, him back in Winterland days. And this photo was taken very close to the time of his uh, death. And I wanted it to look like how he looked, you know, towards the end. And and the title, before I forget, is so, you know, all these stories have been floating around forever. And um, I don't know if you know Lionel B, but um, he is a promoter. And him and I would talk and tell stories all the time. And that's how we came about this, this whole storytelling thing. Mm. You know, being a woman too, people have asked me, Rita, you got to write the story about, you know, your escapades and all this stuff. You know, look at all the men, men you've worked for. And I said, you know, I can't do that because it's kind of like there's, a, there's an omerta. And I learned that from Bill is that, you don't talk about people's personal stuff if you have a personal working relationship with that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, oh yeah, I could write, you know, I could write, a, you know, a, an outrageous book, but <laughs> I've seen those personal assistant rock and roll books and I've read them and they just like, you know, it's just not, it's just not for me because that's one person's personal opinion of that person. Exactly. Maybe and the person was in a bad mood. Maybe that exactly. person was being or they, they were drunk and, and they did something totally. wrong. You yeah. know, whatever. Yeah. You know, the OB2 thing. And yeah. I understand that. Yep. I and, and there's no one, I have to say at my age, I'm going to be 76 this month. Is Looking that, good, Rita. You know, I, I try. You know, <laughs> I really try. But I also take it to genes and DNA and all that stuff. And all the yep. dancing and all the music. Dancing had really, hey, young people out there, exercise when you're young. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it's really, it's really amazing. It's really weird because I was, I was checking you out and I, I was looking at one of your videos with uh, Peter Coyote. Yeah. I've even worked for Peter Coyote. I okay. know. I have it written down. It's funny I mean, how, I've I mean, worked for, you know, Walter J. Haas, you know, of Levi's. Yeah, I got Peter it written Coyote, down. Yeah. Carlos Santana. I mean, the list Ramblin' Jack, on. didn't you? you, you yeah, yeah. I, we, I worked for Your the book. And it's what? like, oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> the men that have flown through my life, you know. Um, the great part is, is that I just hope that at least this is a book that people can time travel a little bit. Mm -hmm. And also most of these people that are buying my book, and I've sold a lot of books and I'm very happy. Good. It's it's like, you know, your age bracket, my age bracket, and and they were at those shows or they experienced those things through a Bill Graham show. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever gone to any other places where it wasn't a Bill Graham show. And to this day and age, it's not the same. It really isn't. No. Um, Bill catered to the audience. That was his first thing was the audience the yeah. artists were second yeah um and the price the just the the way things happen i mean he's the one that brought medical to a rock and roll show rock med i know and dr you dave know? thanks scott thanks dr dave yeah where yeah. someone uh would not get arrested for odin or having a bad trip or whatever it may be right. and um and then the um, 
you know, the forming of lines, just the, the security for, you know, our security were just college kids, adults, whatever, that learned how to treat people with respect. Yep. As opposed to before when there was police with guns. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, um, he started the whole real format of the great rock and roll shows. That's all yeah. I can say. I got to say, I, w- I mean, I used to go to the Kabuki Theater when it was. Oh, the yeah. Theater. I saw, you know, when, um, and I used to go to, um, what, what was the other, Wolfgang's, I used to, the old Waldorf before it burned. Oh, yeah. On. I yeah. used to go there. Yeah, I saw that. I saw so many <laughs> I beam. I mean, he didn't have anything to do with the I beam. I don't think. Yeah, so. no. Did it? Um, but I mean, yeah. The, I mean, the Kabuki, and and I mean, of course, you know, the the like I said, Winterland. I caught the the last. I saw Tom Petty that that run. I mean, that blew my mind. Tom Petty. You know, that was the ice skating rink. Yeah, I mean, it was very. I, mean, <laughs> I remember I was 15, 15 years old. I remember it being very steep. Yeah. It's like this. I don't. <laughs> We were looking around and feeling like, especially the Sex Pistols show, being what the heck? I, it was mind blowing. It really, um, it really changed my life. I, and I, I don't know how I got in. I mean, obviously, I wasn't partying. I was with my sisters, and I, you know, I guess I looked older than I was. But I mean, talk about different times. But I would like to say that, um, you know, we were saying, oh, the old days and all of that, which you know I hear a lot. And having a magazine called the Hate Street Voice, it's not just a looking back at the '60s and all of that. Of course, it's the light that lit the 60s, but also looking forward. And I feel like this book is coming out at a time that's so important for, like I said, that that, tri- that tribal feeling of listening to the stories of the people that were there. And, yeah. uh, and I think this book is really going to inspire um, younger people to understand if they, if and when they go to another concert, oh, why was that security guard being such a, you know, poo or whatever? It's yeah. like, well, you know, they got to keep it safe. Yeah. So you be cool, they'll be cool kind of thing. Um, you know, I mean, Bill definitely. I mean, I was watching a video with Bill. I forget what it was. It was on YouTube. I was doing my homework last night till 2 a.m. Just getting the the Bill juice, you know, the Bill vibe. And um, he said something that I thought was so beautiful. It was about, hang on, let me find my notes here. He said, um, hang on, where did I put that? He, he says, oh. The search for inner happiness, that was one of his his big things was searching for his own inner happiness. And I guess I guess that was a big thing um, through producing these these shows was 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 his way of sort of. Um, obviously, he found great pleasure in, in delivering a beautiful show to the to, to the people. Do you agree? Well, he, he also wanted to expand the minds of concert goers in regards to music. That, you know, the headliner would be what everybody wanted to see. But, you know, he would throw in there like a Gabar Zabo or, you know, Miles Davis, whatever. It was like all these things in order to expand the universe of music to the people. Wild Chapatulas at the Henry J. Kaiser opening for the dead. That changed my life. I know that was early, early 80s. Yeah. 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 At the Henry J that that mix that he would bring to and then of course i think it was ken kesey on the on the i mean was it i think it was ken you know, yelling into the microphone <laughs> ah, there's john down there you know the, the, the yeah wacky, it was yeah the goofiness of it all and at the time you know not it's not about me but i mean i was going through my mother was dying she was sick so it, it going to these Blair Jackson to, and his wife Regan took me to show my first dead shows, you know, and I dragged, dragged me there. I thought that, well, screw the dead. But, you know, <laughs> the realization that there was, you know, there's this laughter and this joy that can be found via the music, via the scene, via the, via the whole, the whole journey of walking into the show, finding your section, you know, and, and just the whole rhythm that he set up at concerts was just unbelievably. Yeah, it's funny because I just, I saw on Facebook the other day, Susanna Millman. Oh yeah, I love her. She oh, posted a photo of myself and uh, Susie Barsotti and Ooh. Colleen Kennedy, and we're on a float. It's Mardi Gras, Grateful Dead. And that was the other thing that we were able to get dressed up in costumes, you know, and do all this wild and crazy stuff. You know, I mean, do you go to a show now where there's floats going through the audience? And, I mean, it's like, come no. on, no. you know, things coming down from the sky and the, <laughs> the 
silly. You know, it's just, uh, you know, Bill riding in on a joint. I mean, come on. It's, yeah. it's, not, it's just not happening. But I mean, Burning Man might be similar to that, but um, uh, oh, my free meeting will end in 10 minutes. Wow, that's a whole new thing. Um, thank you. That's a whole, that's how long it's been since I've done a zoom Rita. I mean, we only have 10 minutes fucking left. Jesus zoom. Um, do I upgrade? Oh, I'm going to upgrade bitches. Oh, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hang on. Look at that. They're making me upgrade. Look at that. They're making me upgrade in real time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, no, I'm just going to get out of this and come back to you. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to give it 10 more minutes. And I guess, I mean, that's so quick um well let's just well we can talk forever okay okay let me let me look at my notes so i do because this is the hate street voice um it's it's hyper local with a global perspective as i mentioned this this edition number 15 coming the spring 2023 edition is about pioneering spirits and of course the man behind me here and yourself pioneering spirits all the way um and um ben fung taurus and like i said the herb green show and the essence of of really being who you are and really finding happiness and really to be in, 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 in what you do in your life and, and that feeling that you get. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, the tribe vibe was the last edition and, and how the tribe is still here, but bringing it back to the hate. Did you spend much time in the hate? I mean, do you, you know, do you have a, I anything? went, there, you know, I, I would go there like to buy stuff, you know, like hippie stuff, but um, I didn't, really hang because yeah. I wasn't per se with the Grateful Dead then that was before my time right that I, I started working with them um but you know it was just so magical mm -hmm. that whole the hate the whole time but going to Golden Gate Park there were freaking hippies everywhere you know you shared everything everything was beautiful mm -hmm. you know I mean, you had your, you know, there was weird things that happened too, but um, I sort of, like I said, back to my street smartness, I yeah. didn't yeah. avoid those kinds of bad things, you know, yeah. but I have to say that um, being a pioneer per se in the music industry, and there's, there's my two bosses right there, um, you know, it's really, like I said, I am so fortunate i'm happy to still be alive to carry on bill's legacy mm -hmm. um i am vice president of the bill graham foundation oh, i, I have been that. on the foundation for many many years um bonnie simmons as you know from kpfa and mm -hmm. Sam back in the day she's our executive director um we we still give out grants little grants to people that really need it you know in in mostly the bay area sometimes we go farther other places due to things but you know we have helped rock med we have helped so many people so i, I might have to hit you up for hate street voice you know it's, I, i'll throw it out there i'm not yeah. you know, it, it would help you know i am the as you said i think in your interview uh with um with um um uh, malagro i'm forgetting her carmen name. carmen you i think you said i am the woman behind the curtain well i am the woman behind the curtain but anyway so the bill graham foundation go ahead and so so i i've still stuck you know um the bill graham way as best way mm -hmm. as i can and um yeah you know he was a pioneer um i i don't consider myself a pioneer I consider myself hmm, an individualist, which is I almost had to create my my everything myself. Yeah. Um, because also in my day, you were supposed to go to college. You know, my dad didn't believe in that. He said, take secretarial skills, mm. which like I said, you know, um, it really helped me. Mm. And also I believed in, uh, pretty strict work ethics, you know. I'd be working at some crazy places where people were totally wasted, yeah. and I and I just said, you know, I can't work like this. Yeah. I have to be straight. So I think that helped me along the way of trust from people that I worked for that I was dependable, yeah. and that if they asked me to do something, I did it. You know, kind of like no questions asked or figured out how to do it even to this day. Yeah. So I um. 
And you're having to say, I mean, you worked with Bill for 20 years. And I mean, and, yeah. who hasn't worked with Bill and not been yelled at? That's the whole, that's the, that's the, that's the story. And I, and I really never was. Wow. Yeah. I mean, one time he did, I said in my, with my other interview, one time he did yell at me. And then Jan, who I worked with said, uh, no, that wasn't her. And then he brought me a little um, gift the next day. And it was, I opened it up and it was a sewing kit and said, can we mend things? Sorry. Oh, and, and he, Aww. with the women, whenever he'd go out on tour or whatever, he'd bring us all back gifts. Every single woman wow. in the office. Wow. So he was a very giving, kind man. And I mean, he brought Santana into the, I mean, Santana has Bill to thank in a lot, so many ways, right? Santana, Carlos loves Bill. And to this day, we still talk about Bill. Um, he was, yeah, he was his godsend, you know, that made him who he is today. Shout out to Santana, by the way, y'all. He's going on tour this summer. I think it starts in May, May through August. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. And he always has his... um you know, he's got his uh, House of Blues thing in uh, Vegas. Right. Yeah. yeah. Who's there. And that's that's kind of a great place to go see him because it's very intimate. You know, yeah. it's a cool venue. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy that that man's still out and about and sharing the love and spreading the love. So, um, God, I'm just, I can't believe we have to, I have to upgrade. Um, let's see. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I, you know, if I just feel so Does embarrassed. Does it cost you? Yeah, I think it does. I just have to fill out this shit. I mean, I can edit this part out. So hold on a second. This okay. Is, it's really ridiculous. I didn't know they, I guess it's been that long since I, I guess it's, it has been. Did you know that they, Hate Street Voice, hang on, Rita. <laughs> Keep talking. Tell me a story. Let's see. Tell me, um, um, let's see. I'm trying to think. Well, you go ahead. Which one of your favorites? Um, I think all my favorites are the stories from the women. Because yeah. the women, it's really, were really incredible writers and had these great perspectives of Bill from, you know, calling him a prophet to, um, you know, and the other thing I have to say, the women within Bill Graham Presents, the camaraderie was incredible. Mm -hmm. There was no jealousy. There's no weirdness. There was no like, oh, you know, you know how you work with women and it just doesn't. Seemingly. oh yeah i know <laughs> i like working with men myself yeah and but there there was nothing weird and bill would also he would send out a memo saying okay ladies um bring your best clothes be dressed ready to go at six o'clock when we close the office and i have a surprise uh -huh. and he would take us on fantasy trips what? okay and he like because he was a very, his favorite thing is Latin dancing. He was a great Latin dancer. Wow. And, and you were uh, a dancer. Wow. And I'm a dancer. Uh. So um, one night, um, he we all got dressed up. The bus came, picked us up. We first went to a studio where we got Latin uh, dancing classes. And they took us to dinner. And then we went and saw Tito Puente at the Fairmont. Oh. And we all oh. danced with him. <laughs> <It's> like, wow. <laughs> wow so it was those those kind of things or else for, for the whole office he's gay okay uh tell your family you're not going to be home till late tonight uh a bus would drive up all of us from the office get in the bus and then we'd go he'd rent out the whole japantown bowling alley oh my god and then they had special bowling shirts made for us and then we'd bowl <laughs> party down <laughs> Oh man, that I was yeah. the best place to work. I mean, I'm sure there was the drama. Okay, now it's making me fill out all this shit. We're probably gonna have to glue this. I can't believe this is happening. Sorry, I've got like it's giving me the countdown and everything. <laughs> oh fuck, I want to upgrade. Less than a minute now. It says you fuckers. I I'll let, I mean, okay, I'm so sorry. This is really horrific. Um. <laughs> It's really horrible. I'm signed in as that shopping cart. Okay, let me give you money, you fuckers. Um, well, okay, Rita, we're probably going to get cut off and then I'm going to have to call you back. Or Is that okay? Yeah, no problem. I'm here. 
Okay, it'll it, it, it's gonna <laughs> run. It is, ah! and they're taking more money from the, the bastards. Like oh, upgrade. Okay, less than a minute. Um, a 